Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is The Ghost in the Time Machine, which is the title of the third prize essay entered in the Bigelow Institute competition written by my guest, Leo Rookby. Leo is a British historian and sociologist of religion specializing in paranormal beliefs, magic, witchcraft, and Wicca. He is a council member of the Society for Psychical Research and editor of the magazine of the Society. He is author of several books, including Faustus, The Life and Times of a Renaissance Magician, A Brief Guide to Ghost Hunting, and Angels in the Trenches, Spiritualism, Superstition, and the Supernatural During the First World War. This interview was recorded in Las Vegas, Nevada, where both of us were present for the Bigelow Institute Competition Awards Ceremony. And now I'll switch over to that video. The American audience really doesn't know that much about the Society for Psychical Research. I think you've got two to 3,000 members. Um, how many is it at the moment? It's, it's over 1,000. Over 1,000. So, there's a lot of people who have heard about it, but really don't understand it. Let's begin by talking and letting our viewers know a little bit about the history of the SPR and what it does. And you, as the editor of the magazine, are really central to all of the activities. Yes. Um, well, I think if people have heard of me before, they'll know me um, either through, through my books or through editing of the SPR's magazine. Um, and that's been a great project for me, uh, to really take on something like that and change it from what it was to what it is now. Mm -hmm. And it's gone through a name change and a whole kind of, um, remodeling. It used to be the Paranormal Review, I think. It did, yes. Um, before that, it even had another name. It was the Psy Researcher. So it's gone through some variations. And when I took it on, one of the things that I had in mind was I've got to change the name at some point. <laughs> but I would, it was my kind of initial overhaul was quite radical. So I thought, okay, I'll leave the name change for a bit later once everything, once the dust has settled. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been a great, um, just such an interesting job. And to explain what the SPR is, it's the Society for Psychical Research. And next year we're going to be having our 140th anniversary. So we're, we're kind of gearing up to, to look at doing some things for that. So we originally um, established in 1882 and in London by a group of um, interested academics and spiritualists uh, and even and, and journalists and so on who were you know, open-minded and wanted to form an organization that would scientifically look at the, these issues. Um, they called it psychical research because at the time, uh, the word, uh, parapsychology hadn't been invented. So that, that only came through in the 1920s. So the, the field was, um, it didn't have a name. You know, this psychical, it was to do with the psyche, um, and then with the spirit. So we all, we think of psychology now, it's just about the mind. But again, you know, psychology was just emerging at that period. Um, so that our kind of our, our framework um, was quite different to that we have now didn't really apply then. So they, they needed a, a term to really cover that field. And although it's a bit cumbersome because you've got two words, you don't have a neat little a little word for it. But I, I think it's better than say parapsychology because it doesn't force you down one particular disciplinary route. It keeps it very open. And that's been a great advantage of the society. You know, you have you have physicists in it, you have biologists, you have psychologists, of course. Uh, myself, I trained as a sociologist, um, particularly sociology of religion. So you have a very interdisciplinary approach coming together in the society. And that gives it a great character. 
And particularly when you go to conferences and so on, you see that huge range there. Lots of different people presenting so many different aspects. Um, and that, that's been one of the, the real joys of doing the magazine, of course, is because you're, you're dealing with so many different people, so many different fields, with different ideas, different angles on the same idea, um, that it's, it's, it's such a kind of intellectual joy to work with. Um, and yeah, and so the society, it's, um, it's, it's very, it's very, UK centered, although it does have uh, an international membership. It's got members in, in America, it's got members in continental Europe and other places right across the world. And, and of course they receive all the publications of the society. Um, it's just a little more difficult to get to the, the meetings and conferences. Um, so that I think that that's always going to restrict an organization when it's um, particularly a membership based organization and it focuses a lot on uh, meetings and conferences as to as to its reach, but uh, hopefully we're seeing things change with you know more involvement with social media and um, you know a YouTube channel and so on. So that the SPR is really revolutionizing itself to to come up to um, what's typical today. Um, so that you know as a, a the editor of a print magazine, um, I'm getting more involved in in the you know social media work and, and just other aspects. Um, there's, there's a good team there um, doing various parts of that job. You know, we, we have somebody who does the, the website, keeps that up to date, keeps that current, um, adding uh, new content onto that. And then we have somebody that's looking particularly at the social media channels, keeping that relevant. Um, and then someone like myself will be doing a lot of promotion across across the board and my own channel and you know it'll get retweeted etc and uh, looking at other ways of publicity getting publicity into the organization so we're, we're looking at 140th as i've mentioned and ways in which we can celebrate that um, one thing i'm going to do is, is put out a kind of call for papers to see if we can get some articles people reflect on the, the history of the society uh, look at how things have changed how they stayed the same and the, the odd thing um, also, as uh, I had a bit of an historian, I, mean, I describe myself as a sociologist, but it, it, I don't, you can't really be a pure ologist anymore. You have to, you have to mix and match. Um, and a lot of the work that I've been doing recently has been historical. And particularly, I looked at uh, the, the First World War and the society's involvement um, you know, in war work and so on, because the Angel of Mons was was a, was a, was a kind of um, critical um, paranormal experience that was extremely well known at the time um, about this apparent uh, an apparition that was seen of described as an angel, described as maybe Saint George, um, that came in and saved the British soldiers at a at a at a, at a very how should we say a difficult point in, <laughs> in time and. This was used for propagandistic purposes. Uh, a lot of people used it um, for religious purposes. And so it was a kind of contested field. And the SPR was involved in its investigation. So, of course, I had was very keen to have a look at that. And just looking into that whole uh, period more deeply, and it makes you very aware of the parallels with today. You know, again, we've come out of um, a, a lengthy war. It's not been quite term the world war but um, you know we've seen uh, conflict in the, in the Middle East for for some considerable time um, you know from Afghan Afghanistan to Iraq um, that we have been waging effectively a world war but we've just not given it that title um, we've come out of that now we've come into a pandemic and again the parallels with the first world war the end of the war and the Spanish flu are there and this boom in spiritualism that occurred through the loss of lives during the war, the loss of lives during um, their pandemic. And again, I think we're seeing a bit of a renaissance for our own subject now, um, particularly with Robert Bigelow's prize, of course, has really generated a lot of interest. Um, but, it's, but also, you know, with, you know, for example, your own channel and how extremely popular that is, people are, are very interested in this subject. And, Although we've seen a lot of this sort of popular ghost hunting stuff for a long time now, I think people are wanting a bit more out of it than just going into a house in the dark and seeing what happens. And they want to 
get those answers that everybody is asking. And you see again that the, you know, the great success of the recent documentary, um, Surviving Death, that was um, based on Leslie Keane's work, um, that, that was just tremendous. And that's breaking a lot of barriers because on the one hand, television has been okay with doing the, the popular stuff, but really doing the serious stuff, and you're, you're hitting this strange taboo against the subject that the mainstream seems to have. And I think you know stuff like this, this documentary, um, this prize, that they're breaking through that now. And this is a tremendous point in time to really reach a wider audience with the, the information that we've all gathered, with the theories that we've come up with, with the analyses that we've put onto it. And you know, I think this is, this is a great time. It's, we're really looking at, as I say, a renaissance for the subject. And those parallels with the past are so, are so intriguing. You, you know, you wouldn't really expect that. Um, but it just shows the importance of also an historical approach and awareness to, to your work. And the importance of persistence. Indeed, persistence, yes. That's, that is a key part because, I mean, this is the thing with, um, particularly with the SPR, that in the early years of the society, it produced some of the, its best work. Um, you had the census of hallucinations, as they called it, and that was basically about people's paranormal experiences. They called it hallucination in a more neutral term. Because again, we we now just think of hallucination in a in a psychopathological um, manner, but but there it was just a, a more neutral term at that time. So work like that um, was just tremendous. You know, this this particular census involved surveying seventeen thousand people, and at the time that was incredible. You look at survey work now, and typically it'll be a you know randomized sample of about two thousand people, and this will be to represent say everyone in the United States of, how many is it, 300 million or something? Yeah. So it's, you see that our, our ideas of what is representative it need a little bit of work, I think. Um, so that, you know, and I think we're looking at a, a point in time now where we can, again, attempt some of those major works as a society and really move things forward. Um, it's, it's an exciting point in time. I'm looking forward to seeing what develops next year. Really looking forward to seeing what happens after um, the Bigelow Prize now, because uh, you know this is—it's got the headlines, New York Times headlines. Um, the coverage for the award ceremony is going to be great. Um, so I think the publicity from this is going to be something astonishing, and it definitely um, behooves us all to really take advantage of that so that we can get our work better known, um, talk to people and explain things and uh, reach out a little bit more. I'm under the impression that the SPR itself as an organization does not take a position with regard to the existence or non-existence of any particular phenomenon. That's right. I'm glad you mentioned that actually because that's, that's a very important point for the SPR. Um, it's basically, it's it's only kind of guiding principle, as it were, that it, 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 as a society, will not take a position. And people have argued against that over the years, um, as of course you would. But I think it's it's the right stance to take because it allows the society to represent the widest uh, spread of ideas on the subject. So. Particularly, a lot of the early SPR work, I mentioned there were spiritualists involved from the beginning. A lot of them left because they found the SPR too skeptical. Um, because a lot of the early investigations were of mediums, and a lot of the time they found some very dubious practices there. So that's, that's still an ongoing job as well, to be, to be skeptical. And it's highly important, but without being, um, Again, taking skepticism as a belief system, but to but to really take it as a, in the proper meaning of the word, to simply um, you know investigate thoroughly and to, to challenge all of your facts or all of your supposed facts, what could be facts. Uh, so the, yeah, this is a central part of what the SPR does, and it allows it to talk to a wider audience because it's whilst individual authors that I may publish will be presenting an argument, it's 
not the argument of the society. So, you know, I welcome letters, other articles arguing the complete opposite. Um, one particular aspect I did um, was looking at uh, the medium Kai Muga, and he's very controversial. And I, I published two issues dealing with dealing with him. One very negative from a, a lot of investigators, and then one actually taking asking him what. What's your position? What do you have to say about yourself? And letting him give his side, uh, which again I think is important, even if um, you disagree with any particular side, is to uh, allow them the, the space to express themselves. And, and particularly because we have this educational uh, function, you know, the organization is an educational charity. So to present this this kind of you know, BBC sort of non-partisan approach is it's again, it's 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 something that should be cherished, you know, because very few people do it anymore, mm -hmm. and it's it's important that we continue that sort of tradition and stick to that principle. I can say, as a member of the SPR and writing my essay for the Bigelow Institute competition, I relied very heavily on the online database of the journals and proceedings going back to 1882. It was invaluable because I don't have the space or the money to house such an incredible library, and there aren't any universities where I live that have that entire collection. But it's online and it's available to researchers all over the world. That's right. It's a significant resource. And I also used it extensively, not just for the Bigelow contest, but in, in all of my work, it's, it's uh, a major factor. We've got the online um, library. It's got you know the journal. It's got the magazine. It's got the proceedings, and going all the way back uh, to the inception of the organisation. Yeah, it's a tremendous resource, and we've also got a an archive, a physical archive in uh, Cambridge, where you can go and look at the material um, firsthand. And I mean, again, that's a little bit more difficult for most people to access because it, it is physical. You have to go to Cambridge to see it. Um, but again, there we've got such a wealth of information. You know, when you... when you There's private correspondence there, for example. You get out, you get out a folder and you unwrap it and uh, you'll take out an envelope and you'll think, well, what's all this about? You see an address, you open it up and then it'll be a, a letter from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, and you use his signature at the bottom. And so you have this connection... Um, with the past, you, that's, that's much more tangible than when you're just looking at digital stuff. When you, when you're holding the paper that person's written on and seeing the, the ink they've written their name in and so on, it's, it's, it's a great feeling to have that continuity, um, stretching way back. So again, that's a, a very valuable uh, thing that the SPR does, make this archive available. It is generally open to the public. You have to uh, make an appointment to go and visit it. Um, but it's well worth a visit. They have a number of artifacts there, as well as just documents, and they also have books, um, a, a large library co collection housed there as well. Let's talk about your essay, The Ghost in the Time Machine. I think that's a brilliant title. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, you know, it, I almost just used the question of the contest as my, as my heading, and and then at the last minute, I thought, no, no, I, I, I can do better than that. <laughs> you know, I can, I did, so I just I gave it I gave it that, and I thought either they, either they like it or they don't. But it's at least it's it's got it's got some character to it, um, and it also has the advantage of although it, it might sound a little nebulous, but actually it, it sums up the entire argument mm -hmm. in just that title. And once you once you've read the essay, you think, ah, yes, that's what he's talking about, and that's it. it that's just the the whole thing, the whole thesis that um, essentially we are ghosts in a time machine. And people will be familiar with this ghost in the machine concept, um, which you know, comes from René Descartes and the mind-body uh, dualism. And this has been a, such a, not just a philosophical question, because we, you know, through modern neuroscience and so on, constantly looking to find those correlates of consciousness in, in the body. And... Although we're now mapping the brain to, to an amazing extent, there's still the problem of consciousness. And we have this assumed model that uh, it is the brain, the physical structure, that, that generates consciousness, and like a projector. And when you switch the projector off, the image disappears, and 
we have this model, but it's an assumed model. And it's also equally convincing that actually the brain just receives consciousness, that it's just a very sophisticated antenna. That also works with what we know about the brain. And, and again, this, this stretches right back into the history of the SPR because a lot of the um, early presidents were, were working with these ideas. Uh, Henri Bergson, um, he was, uh, I think, 1913, 1914, president of the SPR, um, who came up with holographic theories of consciousness um, without even knowing, without even having that term that was yet to be invented. And again, developing the, the idea of the, the brain as a receiver. So the, the SPR, uh, well, maybe not as an organization, but a lot of the key people involved in it have been working with these ideas over the years. And so that was a kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of flip point. You know, if you think, okay, the brain receives, brain generates. If we take one approach, it leads down a certain line, but it's not conclusive. If we take the other approach, it actually makes more sense. And that's from what we're beginning to find out about what consciousness could be. It seems to make more sense that it receives and doesn't generate because the data from, you know, you'll know it yourself from near-death experiences. I mean, actually, I'm using the term actual death experiences because the people are clinically dead. Um, there's a lot of debate over what is death, what can it be, but we're pushing that barrier further and further back with modern science, with modern medicine, um, in ways that were just impossible before. And these, these people are actually dead, but then they come back again because we can now revive people from states that we, we couldn't do in the past. And they, they report experiences relating to consciousness when there shouldn't be consciousness. So we have to ask that question. If, if the brain is just a generator, then it's, it's switched off. It's not doing anything. From every way in which we can measure the brain, it's off. So if it was the projector projecting consciousness, it, it's switched off, unplugged, and in a drawer. It's, it's not, it just isn't in the picture anymore. But people have conscious experiences. Very rich conscious experiences. The experiences of consciousness that people have, that they come back and tell us about, at any rate, um, there isn't, at the moment, there isn't any other way for us to really identify what's going on when these people are apparently dead. Um, but they come back and they'll tell us what they've experienced, and they'll describe those experiences of consciousness in a way which is different from normal consciousness. So, what was important for me and what made this a ghost in the time machine was the fact that people had different experiences of time. And, you know, we're culturally very familiar with this kind of the, you know, your past flashes before your eyes at the point of death sort of thing. So this was, this was a common experience of the past life uh, review. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just this kind of flash image. People would sometimes describe them being able to see their past and indeed their present and, and their future as a, an actual thing that was separate from their observational perspective. And, you know, with, coupled with that, looking at um, a life kind of preview, people would see things that would be happening or potentially happening in their future. Um, and again, they would be able to um, corroborate that later. <laughs> yes, it did actually happen or came to that point where I had a decision and either this or that could take place. So there was a nice bit of corroboration there. But essentially the point was that there was the machine, the body, there was the ghost, their consciousness. The two were separated at that point. The machine was effectively dead, but the ghost was still there. Um, and it had an experience of time, which was different from my usual experience of time. Time's very, it seems very straightforward for us. It's just the passing of things. You know, we, we notice one point, we notice the next point. We're just moving through that. But when consciousness was taken away from the body, time was also not related to the body. And it was experienced in a way that fits in with a lot of, um, theories that are coming out of, uh, you know, modern physics, um, to do with, with time, what time is. Is it because it's been a constant problem? What is time? Why do we have it? A lot of the, um, classic formulas and Newtonian laws, they're, they're time reversible. They, they don't, time just doesn't matter for them. So time was always a problem for physics. It was like, well, what's it doing? Um, but then, you know, with Einstein and, and his, um, uh, teacher Minkowski, they had 
this idea of, of time being a dimension and then led to the space-time, four-dimensional space-time and generating this idea of a block universe. And Let's define that. Some viewers won't know what the block universe is. Yeah, so if, I think if we just think about the, the simple aspect that time is not just this passing of things from one state to another. Really, for ourselves, time, it's just, you know, it's, it's looking in the mirror, it's getting older, it's watching the sun rise and set. It, it's a way in which we just measure things for ourselves. And it's really the sort of the movement of things in space. And it's a way of measuring that, that movement or that momentum. But, um, what Einstein argued was that actually time was itself a dimension. So it's, it's, it's something like, more like, space than, you know, we, we can see it, it, it's there. So one might say, in effect, that the past still exists and the future also exists in the present, even though we're not aware of it. Exactly. That, that's, that's what I was going to come to, is that, yes, all of, these, all of these things that we experience as time's arrow actually exist all at the same time. In a block. Yes. It's just that we can't experience it like that ordinarily because we're we're kind of entangled with the physical and the, the machine experiences time as a, as an arrow but once we're separated from that and we see that you know consciousness does does persist beyond that beyond the, the physical that it has a different experience of time and this relates to the modern physics ideas that that time does exist in its entirety all of the time and we have reports that people can see that and, and this relates to so much more uh, in terms of other so-called paranormal things. Seeing ghosts, apparently, of the past, um, premonitions of the future. Um, particularly those when you look at some very strong cases in which people will have a complete visionary type experience. And they will see themselves in a future scenario, um, which later comes to pass. But they've, but they've seen themselves there in that, doing those things. And, and this raised so many questions for me because you think, well, where is actually the person? Where's the consciousness? If, if the consciousness is in the present, how can it see itself in the future? Because then it's also, you know, conscious in the future, doing these future things. It's also there. Um, and again, with the ghosts in the past, there's, there's somehow, they're not, um, they're not just recordings. This has often been a theory that's thrown out. They're not, because there's, there's no means in which to record that. They are actually just still just there. Um, but only rarely glimpsed. So that, this, these were the sort of breakthroughs for me that allowed to fit together much more of the jigsaw. Um, so I wasn't just looking at any particular aspect um, and, and focusing narrowly on, say, just the near-death experience or just on premonitions or something, but had a, a, a theoretical framework in which I could really use these observational incidents and think, yes, actually, they make sense. If we, if we look at these ghost experiences, we look at these near-death experiences, we look at these premonitions, and there's a whole lot of other stuff, death, death, visions, and, and so on. If we look at these things, they tell us something in their entirety. They're not, they're not talking about separate um, states. They're talking about the same thing, and that it's a different experience of consciousness, different experience of time that happens outside of the physical, beyond the machine. So that, that was the, the, the thrust of the argument. The story that really fascinated me the most that I wasn't aware of, you titled, The Ghost That Saw a Ghost. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, the, because there was, there was one particular instance, um, and they, they, these are quite rare, but they do pop up now and again, in which somebody will see you, you, the typical sort of haunted house, somebody sees somebody going about a kind of repetitive action. And, I mean, the interesting thing is how mundane a lot of these sightings are, so that it does look as though you're just looking at the past, somebody just doing their ordinary thing. They're not engaged in some sort of attempt to communicate or come through, whatever, they're, they're just there. And this was a maid, and she was cleaning out the fire or something like that. And it had been observed on a number of occasions, but on one, one occasion, turned around and saw the person who was in their present observing what he thought was the past, but of course, this this maid was still there in her past and observing something from the future because that person wasn't there yet. 
In other words, the ghost looked up and recognized that someone was looking at her. Exactly. And was, was quite, uh, quite surprised <laughs> by the fact. So, I mean, this was a lovely instance because it, it also it makes you question, you know, where is consciousness, where is time? Because you had consciousness at different points in what we think of as time. You had past, you had present, but you also had future. The present here was the future there, and the past here was the present there. So it, it was just, it was wonderfully confusing to, to try and work through. But I think it showed very much this existence of time as, as a single thing. It exists, past, present, future exist altogether. You describe yourself in your essay as basically a skeptical person, but you were going to use the essay as an opportunity to see if you could convince yourself to let go of your skepticism. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't really about sort of letting go of my skepticism as if it was a, a barrier. It, it's, um, I'm still skeptical. Um, but I, at the time, I didn't actually think consciousness did survive. I, I, I had the, the view that, um, that, yeah, probably the brain generated consciousness, and at the point of death, that was the end of it, although I was aware of all of the evidence. But it was always so difficult to really um, deal with the evidence in a way. When you look at it just singularly, and, you know, new death studies can be convincing on their own. And you think, well, yeah, but you know, could there be other explanations involved? And you, you get a lot of arguments coming in that a lot of these experiences, seeing the tunnel of light is just uh, a sort of um, created by the brain as it, as it shuts down and so on, and, and lots of counter-interpretations. And so, so I was aware of both the for and against arguments for, for most of these things, for all of these things. And as I say, I was skeptical, but... The question posed was, what is the best evidence? Not what is, what is the best skepticism for this? So I thought, okay, well, what I'm going to do is, is try and falsify my position. This is, this is what I think I know, um, or what I think I believe. Um, but I know I'm going to challenge that now. And, and I'm going to come to a definite position at the end because I've been bouncing between the two the, the whole time. Which is, which is greatly unsatisfying. You, you, you're reading something that's um, thoroughly convincing, and then you'll read something that um, thoroughly deflates that argument. And, and this is constantly happening in the subject, and it's very difficult to, to really come up with a, you know, a, a position um, when you have that. But this, this was a great challenge and, and a super opportunity to just say, okay, once and for all, I'm going to get off the fence, and <laughs> I'm either going to be able to convince myself or I'm not. Um, and and, it, and it, it was a, an interesting challenge. Uh, it was also a difficult one because it brings up a lot of personal issues as well. Because you you have to deal with these, you know, sensitive emotional things from, from your own from your own past. Um, so it wasn't. It certainly wasn't easy, and it certainly wasn't just a kind of intellectual exercise. Um, it had real meaning for me to do it, and I think it was important to do it. And I hope that people can. Um, also relate to that because it's, it's typical for people to have experiences but not really to believe in them and to doubt them. And th this was why I used um, Charles Dickens in, in, in the piece because there's this wonderful quotation that he has of, of Scrooge seeing the ghost and, and, and doubting it. Um, and this, this gave me my whole sort of entrance to the argument. You know, we, we do have the evidence. We've got lots of evidence, but we generally, as a, a society, we don't believe it. And why is that? So I call this the kind of the Scrooge paradox, that seeing is not believing. We're, we'll have experiences, but we'll, but we'll continue to doubt them. And it, that was a way in which I could talk about things like, you know, witness testimony. When should we really believe what people tell us? So that when, you know, when we have multiple witnesses to the same thing, it can be over over time or at the same time, um, when we have corroborative evidence, you know, somebody will have um, an out-of-body type experience. This could be in a near-death state in which they will describe things that take place um, when they shouldn't be able to do so. You know, they will be, um, their, their body may be asleep, unconscious, or actually dead, but they'll come back and they'll say, yeah, when, when I shouldn't have had any kind of awareness at all, I saw you do this, um, I saw this happen. And you know that that is just that is mind-blowing stuff mm -hmm. um 
And that's the kind of corroborative evidence where you, you get something that can be independently verified. They'll say so and so wore this color of tie or something, and they couldn't have known that. You know, these sorts of incidents. Um, I think, um, uh, yeah, there was, there, was a, there was a nice story about the, the stain on a tie. Mm -hmm. um, that was Bruce, not Bruce Grayson. Well, yes, Bruce Grayson. Uh, yes, because I was reading his recent books. That just came out this year. And um, he starts that with this wonderful story of having this stain on his tie, which um, somebody had, had seen when they shouldn't have been able to see it and wouldn't have otherwise known about it. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, it's a minor, it's a mundane detail. It's the sort of thing you would dismiss or laugh off, but it's actually um, of such high importance. So it was to bring in all these things, you know, for Scrooge, um, we do generally disbelieve what we see, but actually we shouldn't because in certain circumstances we will have other witnesses and we will have corroborative data that um, we can use. And we also have uh, statistics because, again, these could just be wild exceptions. It might be possible for one person to have this experience but for nobody else. Um, and we have to take account of these exceptions. And by using statistics, we could analyze a great number of cases and see that actually there were patterns in human experience that were not just exceptions, but actually common occurrences. So using a number of different layers of, of evidence, of gathering evidence and analyzing the data, um, I think I was able to get over this Scrooge paradox. And uh, so that, that, was, that was an important hurdle to get over, of course. Mm -hmm. And the, the other part from um, Dickens that was so important for me was, again, his structuring of A Christmas Carol. So, you know, everyone will be familiar with that story. He has the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And this, this kind of, dude, looking at that, and I thought, this, this is actually, this is it. And I thought, I can use this to really structure my work because I mean, having these ideas in the background for, for a number of years, but then um, this brought it all together. This was the time to do something about it, think it through properly, look at all the evidence properly, and come to the conclusion. And so I really I, I owe much of what I did to, to Dickens, which is, which is also great because he's another Victorian institution. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Dickens and the society, did they ever interact with each other in any way? Um, that, he was a member of the Ghost Club, uh, rumored to be, uh, which... The Ghost Club preceded the Society for Psychical Research. They claim to have been founded about 1863, mm -hmm. but they've not had a continuous society up to the present day, although they're still going. Mm -hmm. um, they've been refounded at least twice, um, whereas the, the SPR has had a continuous existence, which is... which It makes for a, a different sort of character to it. But yeah, so he was rumored to be uh, a member of the Ghost Club. Um, whether he was or not, it's something I've been looking into, but not um, not with any great um, sort of urgency. Uh, but, but one thing I did find was uh, that he had been involved in an investigation of a haunt, supposedly haunted house. Uh, he'd had a, a, a disagreement with, with somebody um, who believed in, in apparitions and so on. And he said, well, you know, Give me a list of haunted houses, and I'll go and I'll go and visit one and see what happens. And he, he, he duly got this list. He picked one, which was um, just a, a nice sort of day trip out from London where he was living, and went out to investigate it. Uh, he had Wilkie Collins with him, so it was quite a literary outing. Um, unfortunately, the haunted house in question had been um, torn down some years <laughs> before, and they had no opportunity to investigate it. But uh, I think it, what it showed was that. He didn't just use, say, these sort of supernatural elements as plot devices. It was something that he was interested in and had meaning for him. And I think that, you know, taking this, this literary approach, he actually had some very significant insights without doing a kind of psychological type experiment He's still with the, with the concept of Scrooge and that encounter with the, the first ghost, that of Marley. He, he really saw how most people kind of react to that sort of incident. And, yeah, as I say, he had that psychological insight without having to do an experiment on it. And again, with seeing how 
ghosts do tend to or can appear from different points in time, again, was fascinating. And, and this, this really allowed me to, to think through the whole um, structure and also to bring in a story that people could relate to. Because, you know, I, I do bring in things like quantum physics and so on. And, you know, even quantum physicists will say, nobody understands quantum physics. So it's, it's a difficult and challenging subject. But to bring it in and to, you know, let Dickens tell some of that story makes it uh, easier to deal with, I hope. I would think as a sociologist, and, and I have some background in sociology, having a master's degree in criminology, which is a branch of sociology, you're trained to accept the idea that all belief systems are socially conditioned, and therefore, you study them in, the co in that context without ever having to subscribe to any of them yourself, because you're the sociologist above it all, more or less. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's been an important um, aspect of my approach um, because, as you say, you, you don't involve yourself, or you, you can involve yourself in the, in the belief system, but uh, to separate yourself from it, to the extent you don't need to believe it, and it, you, to have this sort of critical um, distance in, to be able to discuss it in connection with, and relativize it in connection with other um, belief systems and so on it is hugely important. Because I think you know, when you do look at um, religion and all the, the many religions that we have, you, you do see that you have competing claims, you have areas of concurrence and so on. It, it changes the complexion of the thing. And when you look at our own subject, it does devolve into two camps of believers and disbelievers, you know, these sort of spiritualists and, and others and, and um, skeptics, you know, with, uh, there's a kind of, it's a particularly sort of American style of skepticism, you know, with James Randi and so on mm -hmm. um, leading that, or, or had led it. And, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just fighting a war between two opposing belief systems. And it's of, of such high importance to be able to take a position outside of that and just to look at what what the evidence tells us before bringing in um, your own particular beliefs or whatever. I mean, I make I make my own beliefs known at the beginning of the essay because I mean, again, that's a, that's that's it's fairly common in the social sciences is to actually state your own position so that other scholars will know um, sources of potential bias coming from what you're saying, um, and then you you'll try and get to an objective position, but but you never can. So you have to say where you're coming from, uh, what biases, what packaging you might be bringing with you, um, but, to, but to try and achieve a, a critical distance as much as you can in order not to let that influence the data, which is, you know, of primary importance. So I think that that training was hugely important for being able to deal with this subject and, and not to slip into the, the arguments for and against and so on. Um, a lot of a lot of the time when I go and do investigations, I, I prefer to do them sociologically and, and not take a a stance in which I'm trying to prove something or disprove something, but simply just to experience it and then to um, discuss that experience in a sort of social framework, what it means, what it does, um, how the actors perform in it, and so on. And that's that's quite different, and it, it allows you to. It allows you to generate to, to, to generate more data from it. You're not just looking for all the the fors or all the againsts. You're you're not looking for those things at all. You just want the complete experience and how it relates to people, what they make of it. So th that's been hugely beneficial, I think, from for my work. I'm under the impression that if you were to define your position in a succinct sentence, which, well, would be difficult to do, it's that we cannot understand the afterlife fully if we don't have a better understanding of the nature of time. Yeah, it's exactly. You know, time is... For us at the moment, as we're sitting here talking about it, it's tied to our physical existence, uh, as, as is our consciousness. We have this little point inside our heads that seems to be looking out and talking to people, and it's doing it at a particular point in time. Viewers will be looking at this at a different point in time, and it'll seem current to them, but it's already the past that they're seeing. And my consciousness is no longer there. They'll hear me speaking, but it's not 
my consciousness anymore. It's very, it's very strange. So, um, yes, it's, I think, you know, when I started out, I had this skeptical position. Uh, well, I still have a skeptical position. Um, but I, I didn't believe. Um, at the beginning. And now it's a question of not necessarily belief, but I think the facts will lead me in a certain direction. And that is that consciousness does survive. And there is some sort of existence beyond what we know of as the, the physical, this world here and now. Well, Dr. Leo Rookby, what a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And I have to commend you both on the brilliance of your essay, but also on your commitment to the magazine for the Society of Psychical Research and for the wonderful work that you are doing with that magazine. I want to encourage all of our viewers to join the Society and subscribe to the magazine and the journal of that Society. I think it's just a wonderful, important, historical organization that still very much active in the world. Leo, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been an absolute delight to talk to you. And um, thank you for your wonderfully kind words at the end there. And yes, I can only concur to everyone watching this. Please do join the society. And, and for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.